Uh, Australia is in a very interesting position in terms of the innovation challenge. Uh, the challenge for innovation policy in Australia, unlike in most other countries in the developed world at the moment, uh, is a challenge of complacency rather than one of crisis. Uh, Australia is privileged to have enjoyed almost two decades of uninterrupted economic growth. Uh, we managed to escape the global financial crisis without slipping into recession. Uh, as a consequence of that growth, we have very low unemployment, our budget is in a good situation, and our public debt is expected to peak at less than 15% of GDP. So we're very well placed. Uh, on the back of a, a strong economy, we've managed to build a very comfortable quality of life. Uh, on the United Nations Human Development Index, uh, Australia is topped only by Norway. Uh, things are going pretty well. The difficulty with that, of course, is that unlike in a lot of other places where the global financial crisis has forced governments to fundamentally rethink some assumptions, uh, in Australia there's an implicit assumption that business as usual will be, will be okay. There is no burning platform, no sense of urgency around the innovation challenge. What there is, however, is a deep underlying sense within the community a concern that there are long-term challenges that we're not necessarily planning for, preparing for, or investing for, uh, and a sense that the future is uh, something that perhaps we're feeling our way towards rather than actively preparing, and sh preparing for and shaping. Uh, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about more about the Australian context, but I want to bookend it with, uh, with two quotes that to me, uh, symbolic of where the innovation agenda is placed in Australia and in a number of developed countries. First of all, uh, do we have the PowerPoint presentation? Could we just have the next slide? Ah, that's it. Sorry. This is a quote from... Uh, arguably the, the policy expert of the 20th century, John Maynard Keynes. Uh, Keynes's aspiration was that, thank you, was that the expert economist, bearing in mind that Keynes was talking in a time when economics was uh, intricately linked with moral philosophy and solving real world practical problems. Keynes's argument was that the great policy advisor, the great policy expert in government had to reach a high standard in several different directions, combine talents not often found together, must be a mathematician, historian, statesman, philosopher, all in some degree, must understand symbols and speak in words, must contemplate the particular in terms of the general and touch, touch abstract and concrete in the same flight of thought. He must study the present in the light of the past for the purposes of the future. Any policy expert that is capable of doing that is a truly extraordinary person. And Keynes was probably the best we've ever had in this space. Keynes and what Keynes had to say in the 1930s and 1940s is no longer applicable to how we need to do innovation today. And yet the Keynes model of the policy expert that will, from government, that will top down define innovation and create innovation uh, is not suited to a world where knowledge is distributed. We've had a number of sessions over the last couple of days that have highlighted that the fact that innovation is coming from many different sources and often unexpected sources. And yet governments around the world are still operating on a model where the policy experts and the government experts will define and will create innovation. And it's entirely inappropriate for the world we live in now. Australia's innovation policy released in 2008 on the back of a national innovation review is called Powering Ideas. It's an innovation policy that uh, will be familiar to many people because it's the basic formula of national innovation policies around the world. It's consistent with the prescriptions of the OECD Review of Innovation Policies. Uh, it deals with uh, innovation from a perspective that has dominated innovation policy around the world, and that's the perspective that innovation 
is the same thing as science and research. What it doesn't do is actually tap into the evidence of what are the modern drivers of productivity in our economies. It doesn't, for example, talk about the role of design. It doesn't talk about the role of management practice. It doesn't talk about the role of marketing. The second limitation with its approach uh, is that it treats innovation as a standalone. It doesn't treat innovation in the context of innovation being one aspect of a nation's prosperity. It doesn't treat innovation as innovation being a means to achieve a larger public purpose. Uh, and I'll talk about those two issues a little bit more now. What's up on the screen at the moment is a summary of Australia's competitiveness performance uh, against the Global Competitiveness Index. And what this reveals is that Australia is a nation with very strong institutions, exceptionally strong policy leadership, very strong basic health education research systems, and a very strong history of market-oriented, efficiency-based reform. We, in the early 1980s, opened our economy, uh, deregulated our financial markets. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, we further went down the path of competitive markets with national competition policy. And more recently, from 2005, we've had a national reform agenda based around health and education as drivers of prosperity. Where Australia performs uh, less favourably, however, are in areas uh, of innovation, of technological readiness, of the business, the sophistication of our businesses and the management practices of our businesses. Uh, we don't have a culture within government and within government policy of government being a partner in finding answers to questions that we don't currently have the answers to. There is a culture within policy in Australia that is a very strong evidence-based culture and it's a very strong risk-averse culture. So government is reluctant to invest in uh, finding solutions to problems that are genuinely challenging. Why does this really matter? It, it matters a great deal because the nature of the problems that we face in policy today are what we call wicked problems. They're problems of urbanisation or ageing populations and the rise of chronic disease uh, or resource productivity around energy, water and food security. By their nature, these problems involve complex systems. Uh, they are dynamic. They constantly change as they are worked on. And really importantly, they involve the actions and the contributions of not only governments, but also the behaviours and the commitments of businesses, of communities and of citizens themselves. These problems are problems that are not in any way suited to the traditional model of public sector bureaucracy and hierarchy. The public sector is not equipped to deal with the wicked problems that we have to face today. So what do we need? In terms of the how we tackle such problems, uh, one of the things that I think we need to bring to the table is the concept of prototyping, scaling, design thinking. This is how do we find solutions to problems? How do we establish the process by which we learn solutions and then scale up? An aspect of this that we don't talk about too often is the problem that we have in working across disciplines. And in Australia, this problem manif manifests itself in those within policy circles that have an efficiency mindset and those who have a genuine innovation mindset. So we rarely bring to the table, when we're talking about issues such as climate change and shifting resource productivity, or healthy, healthier lifestyles to, make, to combat the rise of chronic disease, we rarely think in the same space about how we bring institutions, how we bring market-based reforms, how we bring the latest technology, and how we bring an engagement with other actors, businesses, communities, and citizens, and how we use these things together in a system sense to affect change. One positive aspect of where we're at in the Australian policy debate is that we're well beyond GDP as the indicator and the metric for progress. Uh, our National Statistic Agency, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, was the first national agency to develop alternative measures of progress. Uh, and our strongest policy institution, the Australian Treasury, 
uh, explicitly has a well-being framework that guides its policy advice. And it's a framework that's based on the capability theories of Amartya Sen. So we are, uh, at least in policy circles, having the discussions around a larger purpose than simply, simply economic growth. With that, policy mindsets are changing. And in particular, we've moved beyond a simple notion of self-reliance and individual reliance to capabilities theory. We've looked, we're starting to move beyond a markets-based approach to systems thinking. And we have moved beyond the objective of economic growth to a broader objective of well-being. These are all really positive developments that position us quite well going forward. However, there is one limitation that we face that, in my view, is the strongest uh, or the largest barrier that we face for innovation in Australia. And that is the failure to articulate the purpose of policy. The failure of uh, our political leaders and our policy leaders to articulate precisely the problems to be solved and the desired future to be created. Unless we can do this, then the tools of innovation policy that applying design thinking, applying market-based reform, applying the latest technology, applying behaviour change, those tools won't be effective unless they're linked to a very clear purpose. So the role of leadership going forward, I think, is twofold. First of all, we need to move beyond the model that governments and policy experts can solve these wicked problems themselves. And secondly, we need to not interpret that as there's no longer a role for government and leadership. There is a stronger role for government and leadership, it is just a different role. And it is articulating the purpose of innovation, articulating the big problems to be solved and the sort of future we'd like to create. Thank you. Thank you so much.